Hello and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the podcast, this is where we explore the practical science of lasting well-being. And if you've listened before, welcome back. I'm joined today, as usual, by Dr. Rick Hansen. So, Dad, how are you doing today? I'm excellent and thoroughly psyched to be talking with Dr. Judson Brewer. Yeah, absolutely. There are a couple of topics that we keep on returning to the podcast. Uh, For pretty understandable reasons, we've talked a lot about anxiety and fear here over the last year. We've explored how we can build more of what we want inside of ourselves and break old patterns of behavior. And then a kind of thread that runs through most of our conversation is the role of mindfulness practice and how we can better understand what's actually happening in the brain and body when we're in a more mindful state. And as you said, we have the incredible good fortune of being joined today by somebody who is an expert in all of that, Dr. Judd Brewer. Dr. Judd is a psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and New York Times bestselling author. He's the Director of Research and Innovation at Brown University's Mindfulness Center, where he also serves as an associate professor. And he's also the Executive Medical Director of Behavioral Health at ShareCare, Inc., and a research affiliate at MIT. And he's also the author of both The Craving Mind and his most recent book, Unwinding Anxiety, New Science Shows How to Break the Cycles of Worry and Fear to Heal Your Mind. So Judd, thanks so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm well, thanks for having me. So do you stand at an intersection that I care a lot about, which is a combination of three things, really hardcore, cutting edge, super cool brain science, second, engaged clinical practice, and third, contemplative practice, mindfulness, perhaps, dare I say it, spirituality. And the first two of those, you know, get combined often enough, especially in the flesh of a psychiatrist such as yourself. But it's that third element that I'm particularly curious about. What drew you in the direction of the inner world and and maybe even drew you in the direction of tapping into some of the world's contemplative traditions? Let's see. Well, I was suffering. <laughs> That's a good start. That's a great That's answer. Where most of us start. <laughs> yeah, I know. Pain is very motivating. <laughs> yes, yes. You know, after college, right before I started medical school, I had gone through a, a difficult relationship breakup and was feeling a little stressed before starting medical school. And so it turns out that my first day of medical school, you know, it was a big transition time for me. So I figured, well, you know, I'm starting medical school, this would be a good time to start meditating. And I had no idea what I would get into and where it would lead, but that's how it started. That's where it started, but what kept you interested? I mean, you you know, again, a lot of people, they'll start and breath, breath, shopping list, they're gone, it's irritating. Yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> what, what hooked you? Well, I can't say it was the first six months of practice because what I remember from that was that I kept falling asleep. Uh, I would listen to these yeah. things. They're called cassette tapes. Maybe uh, <laughs> you know what those are. Oh, you mean in the dawn of time before yes. Forrest was born? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would listen to cassette tapes of meditations before going to class at, at medical school. And I you know, fell asleep for about the first six months. But I also started- You were probably also sleep deprived. I, yes, I think they start us early in the sleep deprivation category. <laughs> yeah. So there I, I started noticing that during boring medical school lectures, I could you know practice paying attention to my breath. And it felt like at least I was being productive with something <laughs> sitting through this lecture. You know, I could practice meditating. Long story short, you know, I was, was doing this MD PhD program and not actually interested in studying mindfulness at all. I was, you know, I, my PhD is actually in immunology where I was looking at the interaction between the immune system and the nervous system and basically why we get s- sick when we get stressed. So, you know, it was just kind of doing this as my own thing. And what I realized was that I had no idea how my mind worked, no idea at all. And, you know, in medical school, I learned some things, you know, you learn the basic neurology and the neurobiology and all of that stuff. Yet the, the pragmatic aspects of how the mind works in terms of what drives us and, you know, in those types of things, I really hadn't learned a whole lot about. And I was actually learning more from kind of looking at my own mind and my own habit patterns about how the mind worked than in, in medical school. Maybe I was not paying attention to those lectures enough or something like that. But I, I actually shifted 
my, you know, I had no idea what subspecialty I wanted to go into when I started medical school. I figured I had, you know, had seven years or so to figure it out. And the course of my practice went that, you know, you, you do a couple of years of medical school and then you do your PhD for enough time that you forget everything you learned in medical school. And then they put you back on the ward. <laughs> Right. Uh, so I went back into my third year of medical school, not knowing what I wanted to do. And so I figured, well, I'm not going to become a psychiatrist. So I'll just do that first as a uh, way get to it out of the way. You know, kind of remember how to interview. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Totally. Totally. And with that, I, I was like, wow, this is really helpful. And it started to click with a lot of the stuff I'd been learning in my mindfulness practice. And so I was thinking, wow, that's interesting. Long story short, none of the other rotations drew me as much as that. And in particular, I was really interested in seeing and working with patients with addictions. That really drew me in. I they were, you know, they're they're underserved often. Um, they get the, you know, they get shunned by society. They beat themselves up. And there aren't very many good treatments for addictions. So I was really drawn in both from the suffering angle of of trying to help patients, but also there's a big doorway in to do research there. You made a comment a second ago that I know that we're going to get to in a little bit, which is that you felt like you were learning more by observing kind of the process of your own mind and kind of what was going on inside of you than you were through some of those more external structures. And you also mentioned habits. Um, and to me, a, most of your work, and please correct me if you think I'm wrong here, but a lot of it focuses on habits of different kinds, like substance habits, like smoking or drinking, addiction, as you were saying, and then maybe like emotional habits would be a way to talk about it in terms of anger or anxiety. And then, you know, growing more of what we want, positive habits like mindfulness. And I think it might be a little bit helpful to sort of ground the conversation and just a little bit of terminology here. You already mentioned kind of a habit pattern a second ago, and we've talked about habit loops on the podcast in the past. Uh, with a couple of different people. But basically for, for people, let's start maybe with something like addiction. Like what's the structure of a habit and why is mindfulness a helpful intervention for people who are having a hard time breaking a habit? That's a good question. So the way you, know, you can think of these is what are the necessary and sufficient components to develop a habit or a behavior? And you can really break it down to three essential elements, a trigger, a behavior, and a reward. Um, rewards, more neuroscience terminology, I think of it pragmatically as a result, like what happened as a result of the behavior. And this goes back to our ancient biology, you know, where our ancient ancestors didn't have refrigerators, so they had to go and find food every day and remember where it was. So you can imagine them out on the savanna foraging, they find some food, there's the trigger, you know, they see the food, they eat the food, there's the behavior, and then their stomach sends this dopamine signal to their brain that says, remember what you ate and where you found it. So it's really a methodology or a really nice mechanism to help us develop what's called context-dependent memory. You know, you learn where something is and what something is that helps you survive. Same is true for, so it's called positive reinforcement in modern day, uh, you know, psychology. And then the same is true for avoiding danger. You know, you see the saber-toothed tiger, you run away, and then the reward is that you don't get eaten. You know? So it's all about eating and not getting eaten. So that's a basic habit loop. So how does this apply to addiction? Well, you, I think of habits, actually most of our habits are really helpful. You know, So imagine if we wake up every morning and we have to relearn every habit that we have, You know, from walking to putting on our clothes to tying our shoes to making breakfast. You know we'd be exhausted before we even made breakfast. <laughs> so, so most habits are really helpful. And the definition of addiction that I learned in residency is very simple, you know, continued use despite adverse consequences. So, so most habits are about continued use and they're, they're there to help us not have to think and relearn. You know, so I think of it as kind of set and forget. You set a habit and you forget about the details. Yet that can be, that system can be hijacked or it can even be a, a habit that doesn't seem, you know, to have adverse consequences until later we do it so much that it does. So for example, using technology, using our phones. Uh, my cell phone is generally pretty helpful, especially if I'm trying to drive into Boston and not get lost. You know, that GPS function, super helpful. But texting while driving, eh, not so helpful. 
Well, so how do you help yourself do the one but not the other? <laughs> well, that is the gazillion dollar question. And that's, you know, that's actually where this intersection between my own personal mindfulness practice and my clinical practice and my research uh, came together. Just, I couldn't have, couldn't have asked for better circumstances there, you know? So after I started, you know, after I'd been practicing meditation for about 10 years, I was starting residency training and thinking that I would shift out of studying molecular biology to retooling to do neuroimaging and uh, looking at you know clinical studies of you know how can we help people with addictions and a lot of my patients were actually using the same language that I had been learning in my mindfulness cr- training you know around craving and clinging and you know you know these things that are unpleasant and trying to you know, mask them or make them go away or things like that and so I thought, well, you know, let's let's throw caution to the wind and just I retooled my entire career to study mindfulness uh, just as a as a potential intervention for addictions. And at the time, very few I don't think any randomized controlled trials had been published on mindfulness training for addiction. So it was a new field. I remember people I was in residency at Yale and people telling me there that I was going to kill my career by studying this, this, you know, squishy candle laden rainbows and unicorn type stuff. Yeah. Here in Marin County, we live in the epicenter of that universe. You got it. (laughs) (laughs) You literally come in through a tunnel. You may have seen it as you come north from the Golden Gate Bridge and you, as you enter Marin County, that tunnel has an arch painted over it of a rainbow. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that's where we live. I haven't yet spotted a unicorn, but definitely a lot of rainbows. All right. So, okay, sorry to keep going. I just had to interject that. <laughs> <laughs> that is fabulous. Yeah, so I remember doing my first study. This was with alcohol and cocaine use disorder and pitting uh, an adaptation we'd made of mindfulness-based relapse prevention, a program that like Sarah Bowen and Neo Chawla and Ellen Marlett had developed. Uh, taking an adaptation of that and trying it clinically, uh, comparing it to cognitive behavioral therapy to see, you know, if it could, if it could work as well as, as that for helping people not relapse. And we'd also put in some physiologic measures where we could see, you know, does it affect people's physiology and their, their psychological responses to stress? Um, because stress is a big, one of the biggest predictors of relapse for people with addiction. Long story short, it was as good as cognitive behavioral therapy, which was great to see. And it did better at helping people uh, not react, not get caught up in their reactions to, to these uh, individualized stressors. And so that was encouraging. We went on to do a study with, uh, with people who were trying to quit smoking, and we got five times the quit rates of gold standard treatment for, uh, for smoking. So that was you know, that kind of opened my eyes enough. Yeah. Yeah, so that opened my eyes enough to say, hey, there's a there there. Let's study this neurobiologically. And we started looking at expert meditators and we started looking at using neurofeedback as a way to do neurophenomenologic studies and all of that. But the, you know, the convergence was really interesting because it was at the time we didn't really know the mechanism. So we started looking to see behaviorally what was happening. And we were finding that people could start to be with their cravings and not react to them, not act on them. In more recent work, stuff that we've just published just this last year and stuff that's still under review, we're actually finding that the awareness piece helps people become disenchanted with the behavior as compared to just needing to write out the cravings. And this is fascinating from a theoretical standpoint because this goes way back to if you look at the ancient Buddhist psychology, you know they talk about exploring gratification to its end, and and that's basically becoming disenchantment with a behavior, disenchanted with the behavior. Oh, you're definitely um, in my wheelhouse. <laughs> you know the topics I I care deeply about, and well, one thing about it that really strikes me, and one reason why I've been so looking forward, Judd, really to hang out with you here. Um, is that this work on addiction, which might seem for them, maybe for those people who just can't stop shooting heroin or using fentanyl or whatever it might be, but actually what you're getting at 
including what you just said there about disenchantment, is this fundamental question of how we can engage life, especially as people who are householders, who eat dinner and have pleasures and watch TV and enjoy life and want relationships. How can we like enjoyable, rewarding, fulfilling, eudaimonically meaningful, et cetera, et cetera, experiences flowing through us? How can we like them without tipping into wanting in the problematic sense of, of, of about them, craving and clinging and so forth. And your work and that of others, like Kent Barrage, for example, have pointed to an underlying uh, neurobiology in which there are distinct, differentiated, interrelated, but distinct neural processes, regions, circuits, and so forth um, that are involved with liking, distinct from wanting, which means that much as experientially we can learn to like without tipping into craving about it, Similarly, we can potentially support the neural processes of this, especially in light of the fact that, again, you well know that liking, enjoying neurobiologically decays fairly rapidly. It's fragile. It fades quickly. But that addiction structure, that habit loop of wanting is very powerful and then takes on a life of its own. It becomes self-reinforcing, takes on a life of its own. So we really need to kind of support processes of liking in effect to decouple them from you know forces of craving, addiction, and so forth. And I think about the proverb, and I'll finish here with the how question, that um, liking without wanting is heaven, while wanting without liking is hell. So how, what have you learned? Dr. Judd, uh, that can help us in regular life enjoy and engage life while resting in liking without getting sucked into the ancient circuitry that drags us into drivenness of wanting? Such a great and deep question. And I think, you know, one place to start here is, and I, I find this is helpful clinically as well, is just to help my patients understand the difference between these things and where they come from. Uh, because often there's a lot of uh, misinformation and, and not even intentional, but just you know some misconceptions around these things. So for example, you've probably heard this as well. You know, people often talk about dopamine as this pleasure molecule. It is, it, it is far from a pleasure molecule. It, it's not actually set up that way, evolutionarily speaking. So you can think of dopamine serving two functions. We already talked about it, one of them, which is to help us learn things, right? When there's surprise or when there's something unexpected that happens, we get a dopamine surge that says, hey, remember this, this is important, whether it's finding food or seeing danger or whatever. But that dopamine firing shifts from that initial surprise that quickly becomes, becomes habituated and dopamine doesn't fire anymore when we go back to the bush of berries or whatever but it starts firing in anticipation. So we're, you know, our, our ancestors are sitting in the cave and they're like, I'm kind of hungry. And that dopamine fires and says, go get the food. And so there's that motivating quality. And that's what the difference between liking and wanting is. Liking can say, hey, this isn't poisonous. You should eat some more of it. And the wanting says, go eat some more. <laughs> go get it. What are you waiting for? <laughs> So just understanding that difference, I think is really helpful as a, as a starting point where somebody can see, oh, there's a difference between liking and wanting. And this goes all the way back. You know, you can even see this clearly represented in ancient Buddhist psychology where they, they clearly differentiate the liking and the wanting piece. Yeah. So just knowing that it can be really helpful for folks, especially if their mind seems like a black box. It starts to illuminate that and they can start to just see, oh, here's where here's where I'm liking something and here's where I'm wanting something. And, yeah. and then the sense it of helps freedom, us. if I could interrupt you, the sense of freedom and, yeah. and, and I can enjoy this without chasing after it endlessly. I don't have to try to catch it or capture it or thingify it. I can enjoy it flowing through me without getting into trouble about it. That is a kind of freedom. We're not the puppet pulled by the strings of desire. Absolutely. And often we don't even notice that those strings of desire are pretty unpleasant. I don't know if you've noticed this, or I've certainly I've noticed this myself, uh, where you know if I'm eating 
some ice cream. I've got an ice cream cone and I'm, I'm wanting that next lick while I've already got some in my mouth and I'm not paying attention to how good it tastes. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. Or here's another version of it. You're perfectly content. You feel just fine, but you can watch your mind on autopilot looking for something new to want. <laughs> yes. Even though you're fine. Yep. Yes. Yeah, it's, yes. it's just kind of like it's set up to want to want. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, so how, what can we do? So in addition to recognizing and appreciating the, the freedom, we're, we have choice here. Forrest mm -hmm. talks a lot about that space of choice, Viktor Frankl and others too, between stimulus and response. Mm -hmm. um, what else can we do? Especially what else can we do that is informed by the deepening understanding of our own neurobiology? So here, this is where... You know, I, this has been a fascinating journey for me in terms of really getting deeper and deeper into the understanding of how habits truly form. So if you look at how habits form, this process, positive and negative reinforcement, is also known as reward-based learning. So reinforcement learning, reward-based learning, because our behavior gets reinforced based on how rewarding it is. So notice how if that depends on not the behavior. It doesn't even depend on the trigger. A lot of folks that say, oh, if I could just find all the triggers, you know, I could what get rid of them or whatever, you know. So here, it doesn't have to do with the trigger. It doesn't have to do with the behavior, but it has 100% to do with how rewarding that behavior is. So in that sense, we can look at that biology and say, okay, what's important about this? Well, what's important about that is to really pay attention and see how rewarding something actually is. Go back to the ancient Buddhist psychology, they called it cause and effect, right? So if you look to see how something rewarding it, how rewarding something is, that will determine whether it gets perpetuated or it doesn't. I'll give you a pragmatic example and then we'll go into the math behind this because it's all mapped out for, for 30, 40 years, this has been mapped out. So with my patients who want to quit smoking, what I have them do is, and this seems strange to them at first, but I have them smoke, <laughs> but I have them pay attention as they smoke. And I say, pay attention to every aspect of it. And what they realize is that cigarettes taste like crap, right? That's why they make <laughs> menthol cigarettes. That's why, you know, all this, you know, all this stuff to, to hide the flavor and hide the fact that somebody is inhaling basically a toxin. You know, nicotine is not good for, our, generally not good for our nervous system. So, same thing for overeating. If somebody, you know, we have this app called Eat Right Now, and we built in this craving tool where we have people pay attention as they overeat. And as they pay attention when they overeat, they realize it's not actually that pleasurable. So they can start to see that cause and effect relationship. When I overeat, I feel guilty. My stomach feels bloated. This isn't as great as I thought. And in fact, we did a study where we just published this, where we found that it takes as few as 10 to 15 times of somebody simply paying attention as they overeat for the reward value of overeating to go to drop below zero. And that, that's critical because that's really the only known way to change a behavior. And here's where we can geek out about the math. So there are these two researchers back in the 70s called Roscorla and Wagner. And what they developed was this model around, basically around habit formation, which was something is gonna have a certain reward value. And that reward value is based on the previous reward value where it was a moment ago or the last time we did it, plus an error term. And that error term helps determine, that's what determines whether we're gonna repeat the behavior, whether it gets stronger or it gets weaker. I'll give you a concrete example. So. If we, it, let's say I like chocolate cake and I, so I set up a certain reward value in my brain for how val, you know, how much I like chocolate cake. And I go to a new bakery I've never been to before. I see some chocolate cake in the window. I eat it and it is the most delectable chocolate cake I've ever <laughs> had. Okay. <laughs> So that we're all getting error, hungry right now. Yeah. Way to go, doc. I'm like Pavlov's dog here. I'm salivating. You rung the bell. Yeah. Yeah. So if it's better than expected, my brain gives me what's called a positive prediction error because it predicted that it would be so rewarding and it was actually better than expected. Positive, positive. Okay. If I eat the cake and I'm like, meh, I've had better. Then I get a negative prediction error. 
okay? And that meh part is what helps us start to become disenchanted with the behavior. So if I smoke a cigarette, I'm like, ugh, that negative prediction error kicks in and it's less rewarding. If I overeat, I'm like, that's not that great. That negative prediction error kicks in and it's easier for me to not overeat. Notice how none of that has to do with me telling myself that I shouldn't overeat or that trying to use willpower in some way. Does that make sense? Oh, it does. And what's so striking about it is that it's about being authentic with your own experience. What is it actually like to smoke that cigarette or, you know, just eat massive, vast quantities of chocolate cake? Um, I had a spiritual teacher back in the 70s who had a saying, once a philosopher, twice a pervert. In other words, there's a place <laughs> where we're enjoying things once, but it's when we get hooked by them that we start getting into all kinds of trouble and so forth. And so I just love this approach that it's about telling the truth and honoring your actual experience of what you're doing, uh, which then gives you, of course, some autonomy, some freedom in relationship to it. The, the more I study this, both from a personal and a professional standpoint, the simpler it actually gets to the point where if you look at all of these pieces, they really come back to one thing, which is awareness, right? You have to be aware when you're doing a behavior to get that positive or negative prediction error. If we're not paying attention when we eat the cake and somebody says, hey, how's that bakery? We say, eh, good enough, because <laughs> you know, we haven't paid attention. And that, that uh, reward value stays the same. One of the things that strikes me too is that many people have had um, this kind of negative prediction error routinely. They've, they've had that occur, but they didn't learn from it. They didn't learn from it. And one thing I hear you talk about is bringing, helping people bring a heightened level of self-awareness, of mindfulness of their actual experience, including some of the granularity of it, that, yeah, I feel this in my mouth and it's sweet, but my body altogether is not really enjoying this this much. Right. And for myself, I, as you may know, I focus a lot on how we can uh, learn how to learn, especially in social, emotional, somatic kinds of ways. And actually steep in our own personal learning curve, especially for the third or half of the population in a, let's say, a research study who typically doesn't even get, doesn't get that much out of it, even if the upper third drags the mean of the group over the finish line, so you get a statistically significant difference from a control group. But what about people in general who are having the intervention? What could they do to heighten their embodied learning from that moment of authentic experience that eh, the cigarette, the, the cake isn't really so great? So that that sense of that, the disenchantment of that uh, can sink in really deeply in them, fostering a kind of motivated conviction in them. I would think about that. Yes. And well, here, if I'm understanding what you're saying, I think of that attitudinal component that often is described as, you know, is kind of that part of the mindfulness practice. That attitudinal component of curiosity is key. I would, I would think of it, I think of it as a superpower because the more we get curious about our experience the more we really see very, very clearly what's happening and we're not judging it. We're just saying, oh, you know, what's going on? Oh, wow, I didn't realize that eating four pieces of cake really doesn't feel that good in my stomach <laughs> as compared to telling, you know, beating ourselves up over it. <laughs> right. So that piece, I think, can really heighten the experience. And I would say it in itself can become that, the new habit, you know, so wouldn't, you know, we're talking about breaking unhelpful habits. Well, how about, how about supporting helpful ones? And I would say, you know, besides the joke about killing the cat, curiosity is absolutely helpful for so many things, you know, from breaking bad habits to starting new habits to even, even helping us, you know, see where we've got biases, you know, like societal biases, for example. Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a great point, Judd, and I just want to tie everything that you're saying here about habit formation, reward, value, your kind of expected return, if you want to think about it that way on a particular kind of behavior, to your work broadly on anxiety. 
Um, because you refer to anxiety in your new book, Unwinding Anxiety, as a habit. Um, and for starters, I thought that that characterization was really interesting, and I definitely want to ask you more about that. But in terms of this structure that you're describing, most people would probably not think of like an anxious experience as something that we get a lot of reward out of. <laughs> so clearly something's going on there that maybe is a little bit counterintuitive. And I just wanted to ask you about that. Yes, it's a great question. This is probably, I don't know if it's another class in medical school that I must have slept through or not taken notes in or whatnot. <laughs> Yet I, did, I had no idea that anxiety could be driven as other habits could be. And this actually came from, you know, more suffering where I was really trying to figure out how to help my patients with anxiety. So if you look at the medications, the best medications out there, there's this term in medicine called number needed to treat, which gives us a quick and dirty calculation on how well a, a treatment works. So that number needed to treat for the best medications for anxiety is 5.2, which means I have to treat five patients with medication before one of them shows a significant reduction in symptoms. So I'm basically playing the medication lottery. You know, I don't know which one's going to benefit. Uh, I think genetics, it's going to get better over time where we're able to predict responses. But right now, we don't have those at our fingertips. And I don't know what to do with the other 80%, you know, which, which person is going to benefit and what am I going to do with the other four out of five? So I started getting anxious about how to treat my patients with anxiety. And, you know, it was interesting. Somebody in our Eat Right Now program was mapping out her habit loops around eating. And she was saying, you know, I realized that anxiety triggers me to stress eat. You know, can you create a program for anxiety? And I was thinking, well, I'm a psychiatrist. I prescribe medications. But it put this bug in my ear to look back in the literature to see if I'd missed something. And lo and behold, from the 1980s, you know, there was an emerging literature that I hadn't learned about in residency, led by Thomas Borkovec and others, suggesting that anxiety could be negatively reinforced like other habits. And when I saw this, you know, that my perver my eyes proverbially popped out of my head because I was like, oh, I never thought about that. And wait a minute, I know something about how to treat habits. So, <laughs> so I started bringing those together to see if we could actually, you know, if we could if we could make a treatment that could help people with anxiety. And long story short, we developed this unwinding anxiety app and started testing it in my in my lab. And the first <laughs> first study we did was with anxious physicians because. Physicians, I can say this from personal experience, we tend to be pains in the asses to work with, you know? So I'm thinking if we can work with the most challenging populations, like physicians who never take time for themselves, you know, they, they armor up, they, they're the martyrs because we're, you know, we're thinking, well, if I care for myself, I can, I'm wasting time where I could be helping my patients and all that stuff. So we started there, we got a 57% reduction in clinically validated anxiety scores in these anxious physicians within three months of them using the app. Now, that was remarkable, but it was a single arm trial, it was relatively small. So I was thinking, well, this could be a fluke. So we, you know, we got some funding from the NIH and did a randomized control trial with people with generalized anxiety disorder. And there we got a, wait for it, 67% reduction in anxiety. And we could also calculate the number needed to treat. And that number needed to treat was 1.6. So that blew me away. That's pretty great. Super powerful. Yeah. Yeah, that really blew me away. And we could go on and study the mechanism behaviorally and, and figure out that it was actually truly helping people with, with the worrying. So if we, if we map this out as a habit loop, the anxiety is a feeling, triggers people to worry. And that worrying is what provides that reward. And, and it tends to come in two flavors. One is that it distracts somebody from the worst feeling, feeling of anxiety. So worrying feels better than feeling anxious. Or the other is it gives them this illusion of control. And I say illusion because people feeling in control doesn't mean that they're actually in control. You know, for example, let's say, uh, hypothetically speaking, uh, somebody's son gets his driver's license and dad starts worrying about his son when the first time he goes out driving with his friends. Well, I can promise you that dad worrying doesn't 
equal sun being safe, right? The more he worries, it doesn't mean that that's, you know, going to linearly correlate with the proportion, the likelihood that the sun is going to be safe. So here, you know, worrying is just worrying and it's, it's making, (laughs) it's making the parent nervous and stressed and actually feeding back and driving more anxiety. So mechanistically speaking, we could specifically target the worry not only target the worry and help people step out of that habit loop as a mental behavior, but also help people relate differently to their anxiety and be with it rather than trying to push it away or get away from it. I think of um, a lot of, for a lot of people, um, anxiety is related to fear of worsening. And in a funny sense, the worrying or the other anxious behaviors are rewarding in the sense that as long as I'm worrying, it isn't getting worse, so it must be working. I should keep worrying. And I think related to that, routinely, so I'll do practices with people trying to help them recognize factually that in the present, you're basically all right right now, when you are. There are these moments when we're not. We're running out of a burning building, a shark is attacking us, we're in terrible pain, terrible loss, you're not all right right now. But most of the time, you're uh, basically all right at a bodily level. You're breathing, your heart is beating. Those signals are coming into your hypothalamus. Generally, you habituate to them, you tune them out, but in fact, you can actually foreground them. Like you can recognize the reassurance that in the present, whatever the past has occurred, whatever the future holds, you're basically all right right now. What I routinely run into with that um, is people saying, oh, it makes me nervous to recognize that I'm basically all right right now because I'm afraid of not being afraid. I'm afraid, I'm anxious about not being apprehensive, uneasy and armored and so forth, because that's when in my past, I would lower my guard and wacko, my big brother, my big teacher, someone you know, would bonk me and then I would be in a lot of pain. And so it's really, I think, interesting. And I wonder what you think about this for people to appreciate that they can be uh, adaptive, they can be effective, they can be alert, they can be vigilant, they can track what's ha- happening around them. They can cope with threats without having anxiety invade them and remain. What do you think about that distinction? I think it's a really important distinction. So I bring, I'm glad you bring it forward. And so just to highlight a couple of aspects of that is, you know, fear is an adaptive survival mechanism, right? As you point out. And anxiety is basically fear of the future. Well, we don't know if we're going to truly be in danger in the future. And actually being anxious isn't going to make us safer. Planning for the future is going to make us safer than being anxious because anxiety makes our thinking and planning part of the brains go offline. You know, so, so here it's really helpful to distinguish fear, like am I safe right now, versus fear of the future. Am I going to be safe in the future? And We, you know, being able to see the difference and like you're pointing out, be able to ground ourselves in the present moment. Oh, I'm not in danger right now can really help us calm down. It can also help us not get caught up in those anxiety and worry cycles. The second piece that you talked about is also really important. So, you know, this, um, I think of it as we become, so our brains habituate really quickly to things, to basically everything. And that helps us be able to learn new things, right? So we habituate, we become familiar with worrying. And when worry becomes a habit, when worrying becomes a habit, when we're not worrying, our brain says to us, hey, something's different. Because our brains basically don't like change. Change is scary because it's signaling, hey, something's different. You need to check to see if there's danger out there. But stopping worrying is not or happening happening not to worry in a moment doesn't equal danger. And so if we can just recognize, oh, this is different as compared to this is scary, <laughs> we can start st- start to step out of these habit loops. And I, I actually wrote about a patient in my Unwinding Anxiety book who specifically struggled with this. He had basically generalized anxiety for 30 years. And when he started to be, have stretches of time when he was calm, he came into my office and he says, it's so strange, I'm, I'm feeling nervous that I'm not nervous. And he was basically worrying that he wasn't worried. And so we started to work with that in just in terms of helping him ground in, I think, exactly what you're talking about, which is, 
hey, it's okay. This is just your brain signaling that there's change and you're going to habituate to becoming, to being calm pretty quickly. And that's exactly what happened for him. It feels like there are these two categories that we're kind of interacting with here a little bit. And the first one is what you're describing, like generalized anxiety disorder, people who have a persistent issue where they just, they are anxious all the time. And then you've got a category of of other people who are facing situations that could be reasonably anxiety provoking, like, you know, hey, a global pandemic or whatever, wherever else you want to take that. Um, but, you know, just over time, it accumulates and maybe their system becomes sensitized to it. And so they're looking at this whole thing being like, wow, I don't know, my life feels pretty stressful right now, doctor. Like, should I be anxious about it? And like, what amount of anxiety is kind of the right amount of anxiety? Um, and I'm wondering, for starters, just like, are the, do you think of these as being two different categories for people, like acute versus generalized anxiety? And do you approach them differently in terms of like offering treatment or ways people can think about it? Yeah, so starting with the second question, I don't approach them differently. You know, I see anxiety is anxiety in the, because it's really all we have is our present moment. And so if we're anxious right now, that's all we can work with. Now, whether it's acute anxiety versus generalized anxiety, you know, this one thing to point out, and this is something that can be really challenging for some people to, to really uh, play with or start to explore because they've had this idea that they've got to be, have some level of anxiety to get through their day or perform well or whatever. So I think it's really important to help people start to really explore, you know, this question of how much, how much anxiety do I need? And there's a lot out there on the internet, unfortunately, about, you know, things like these um, Yerkes dodson curves of, you know, optimal anxiety and all of that. Well, I, I spent a bit of time in my book writing about this because it was really important to dispel some of these myths. And it turns, you know, long story short, these two researchers back in 1908 published a paper with Japanese dancing mice where they basically, you know, shocked them to various degrees and measured how well they performed on some maze task or something like that. And that paper was largely ignored. I think it was only cited like four or five times for 50 years. And then a famous psychologist gave a speech at some conference and and just loosely equated anxiety with arousal because Yerkes and Dodson talked about arousal. Like, you know, if the mouse is asleep, of course, it's not going to perform well. If the mouse is like shocked to death, it's not going to perform well. And if you kind of shock it enough that it wakes up and and realizes that you're trying to get it to go through a maze, then it's going to do better than the other extremes. And so they had this kind of curve of op- what they called basically optimal arousal. We can we can debate how optimal that is <laughs> in terms of real world conditions, but that's what they did. So so the psychologist said, you know, just loosely equated anxiety with arousal, and then one of his former grad students took it and ran with it and did a. a experiment with rats uh, where basically held their heads underwater for certain periods of time and found that if you held their heads underwater too long, they performed poorly in whatever they were doing. Shocker. I know it's <laughs> you know like you need to torture animals to, to realize these things. But either yeah. way, uh, in, in that paper, that guy just blank, you know, blanketly uh, equated anxiety with arousal. And since then, so that was like in the 50s, I think 56 or something was when this paper was published. Again, not not cited that much. Then comes the internet. And suddenly, you know, these papers went from being cited 10 times to 100 times to 1,000 times. Just that, you know, the, the citations went exponential, not based on new data, but just based on people thinking, oh yeah, you know, you got to have some level of, of anxiety to perform optimally. And so this Yerkes Dodson, they called it the Yerkes Dodson law, you know, going from Japanese dancing mice to, you know, drowning rats. Uh, when people actually look at human performance, there is one clear thing showing that there is an inverse relationship between anxiety and performance, meaning the more anxious you are, the less likely you are to perform well. And when we think about this logically and rationally, I mean, 
look at the opposite of anxiety. Look at people in flow. Like look at I, I like to look at uh, folks under extreme pressure, like uh, sports folks, you know, who are who are just performing optimally under really challenging conditions. You know, Usain Bolt, right? Look at his face when he's when he used to crush the competition in the hundred meters. You know, he had this huge grin on his face. Uh, Chloe Kim, I don't know if anybody knows her. She's this, uh, I think she was 17 when she won the half pipe gold in the 2018 Olympics. And she just was on fire, you know? And so Michael Jordan, his tongue's hanging out of his mouth, you know, when he used to do his 60 point games in the NBA. So if you look at optimal performers, they don't look anxious and they don't say that they're anxious, you know, because they aren't anxious, you know, and a lot of them, they talk about things slowing down as compared to things speeding up, which is what anxiety tends to feel like. So there's a long story short, there's really no evidence that any level of anxiety increases performance, despite what you might read on the internet. That's great. Uh, rock climbing, something I've done, you've talked about surfing before we started here. And it's so striking to be in situations that are objectively hazardous. And there's a recognition of the hazards. And there might be a little bit of activation, a little bit of uneasiness, just certainly enough of that fizzing away to kind of keep you on your toes. But on the whole, you feel capable, you feel competent, uh, you know what you're doing, you're having the time of your life. And so we can see this decoupling here, much as we saw it with regard to enjoyments much as, and I think that parallel is really striking, much as we can like without wanting, in other words, we can enjoy without getting, moving into greed about it, we can experience what's unpleasant without hating it, without moving into fighting, fleeing, or freezing in our relationship to it, which actually tends to undermine an effective adaptive response. So isn't that cool, the parallel there? Uh, yeah, we can dislike without hating it. Uh, and I think that's very relevant to this material about anxiety. Absolutely. Because if we dislike the dislike, <laughs> or, yeah. or like you're saying, hate the dislike, <laughs> it just makes yeah. things worse. That's right. That's right. I think this is a great point that you're making here, Jad, and I just really want to underline it because we talk about a lot on the podcast, the value of like positive experiences versus the value that people attribute to to negative experiences of different kinds. And, you know, there's complicated literature on things like post-traumatic growth and then the other like potentials that can come out of very stressful experiences. But broadly speaking, stress, we call it stress because it's not great for you. You know, like that's kind of the generalized, you know, situation with, of course, some meaningful caveats of different kinds. But um, I would love to spend a moment asking you about specific interventions. Uh, you do a lot of stuff, particularly in the latter half of your book, focused on things that people can do to interact with their own anxiety in a world that, you know, as you were pointing to earlier, is increasingly designed to activate a sense of anxiety in us, <laughs> whether it's through our smartphones or otherwise. So are there specific practices that you found just like particularly useful for people? Well, I would say knowing categories of practices and how the practices function is probably more helpful than prescribing a specific practice. So here's where- Great, yeah, awesome. Yeah, here's, we can think of this as like individualized medicine or individualized mindfulness. Think of it that way. So I'll, I'll give the example of things not to do, which was, um, you know, me not understanding why I was supposed to pay attention to my breath and basically- beating my head against the proverbial breath wall for 10 years, trying to concentrate and it not going so well. <laughs> Maybe I have a thick head, so I kept going. I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's why I say understanding what these pr practices are for is really critical before we practice them. So here, for example, just understanding and seeing these habit loops of our mind and seeing how having some type of an anchor for the present moment can just help us slow down enough or even you know stop from getting caught up in these habit loops so we can see them and we can kind of see them in play. So one thing I you know I've kind of set up the book as a three-step process. The first step there is not a meditation practice at all. It's actually helping people just map out their habit loops, you know, what's the trigger, what's the behavior, what's the result. 
And that in itself is tremendously illuminating for a lot of folks just to see, oh, this is how my mind works. And what that can also do is trigger some curiosity, whereas, you know, they're getting some positive reinforcement. Oh, I'm learning something. You know, generally that feels pretty good. And they can take the momentum of that curiosity in to finding some way to bring awareness. Let's say it's with an unhelpful habit, uh, whether it's worrying, let's just use worrying as an example, because that's very, very common where someone can then start to explore, oh, what do I get from worrying? You know, again, it's not, they're not sitting down and meditating, they're exploring that cause and effect relationship. And as we talked about before, that's really a key driver for change. So often I tell people, you know, this isn't, this isn't the most, this isn't where you're gonna bliss out on checking to see, you know, what you get from worrying, because often people think, wow, this, (laughs) this is not rewarding at all. I think like you all pointed out earlier. When they see that, that's where they start to build this enchantment. And that's where they can shift into this third step where I call, I think of it as like the BBO, the bigger, better offer. And this is really where the mindfulness practices come in. Because if our brains are set up to look for things that are more rewarding, let's give them something more rewarding, but not something that comes in the form of a distraction or something else that can be habit forming something that's going to help us flourish and ideally help the world flourish. So I think of these, these third step practices coming in two main flavors, you know, curiosity and kindness. So curiosity is basically as, you know, as said, you know, just being curious about what's happening. And so if we're sitting down to do a formal meditation practice, We could be using an anchor of the breath. We could be paying attention to sound. We could be paying attention to physical sensations, whatever. The key is to get curious. Oh, what's going on in my experience? And that that can help us do two things. One is to start to see when our mind is pushed or pulled. You know, oh, there's something pleasant. My mind's running after it. Oh, that's interesting. And I can see that. And also seeing, you know, maybe there's an unpleasant physical sensation and our mind wants to run away from it and we daydream or distract ourselves or whatever. Oh, that's interesting. But that, oh, itself helps us turn toward our experience rather than escaping from it in one form or another. So that can be applied to any practice that we do, any type of meditation that we do. The other flavor, just to touch on that, and, and I'd love to hear both of your thoughts on you know, how you see all of these things fitting together, but if you take curiosity as one flavor and take kindness as another, another flavor, boy, are we really good as humans and as societies at judging ourselves, judging other people, judging everything, judging our experiences, if you want to add that as well. And so we can start to map out these habit loops around judging ask ourselves, what's it get? What's it feel like? What do I get when I judge myself, when I beat myself up? What do I get when I judge somebody else? And then compare that to what it's like when we're kind to ourselves. So here we can bring in a number of different types of kindness practices. And I'm sure you've explored many of those on this podcast, so I won't go into the details. The, The details aren't that important right here, but the, the understanding of being able to see and reflect on what kindness feels like compared to being mean to ourselves or others, that's what's going to help our brain tap into that reward-based learning system and say, um, "Can I have some more kindness, please?" You know, and then we start to practice <laughs> practice that more and more. Yeah, I think of wanting and its two valences: wanting for and wanting against, as a drive state. Craving is a drive state. And I think about the Buddha's uh, Four Noble Truths, uh, his drive state model (laughs) of uh, suffering and freedom from suffering. It's about drives, including in a very biological sort of sense. So what is the basis for drives? Well, it's a sense in the moment, whether it's grounded in reality or not, but an internal sense that's powerful enough that something is missing or something is wrong there's a deficit or a disturbance in reference to a fundamental need. Let's say we have to simplify three major needs, safety, satisfaction, and connection. And so when we don't feel safe enough or satisfied enough or connected enough, kaboom, naturally, the brain, the body goes into a drive state in relationship to that. And then, you know, trouble follows. So one thing I think about love, for example, kindness, let's say, and is so 
great is that it naturally tends to draw us into the felt sense in the moment of safe enough, satisfied enough, and connected enough inherently. Because warm-heartedness, whether it's flowing out or flowing in, as you well know, uh, is a primal signal of safety, including rooted in our own hunter-gatherer backgrounds. Same way that warm-heartedness is rewarding. You know, it feels good, right? It feels good in the moment. It's good. And also, obviously, it helps us feel connected. So in the moment then, there's fullness and balance as we rest in that warm-heartedness in the present rather than a sense of deficit or, dis or disturbance. And so for me in general, it's it's also really helpful to appreciate that we get anxious or addicted because at bottom there's a invasive sense at some level that we don't have enough. Something's missing, something's wrong. So if we gradually do what we can to address our circumstances and the wider world and all this at all scales to you know help there be enough for everyone, that's good. But meanwhile, as we repeatedly internalize the felt sense in the moment of enough, as well as, as you said, disenchantment for the inner ad agency that always wants us to chase carrots and run from st sticks that are usually exaggerated, because that's a great way to motivate monkeys, you know, or rats back in Jurassic Park. Uh, as we can do all that, then increasingly we become freer, right? Mm. In relationship to what's pleasant or unpleasant, uh, to freer in relationship to addictions and anxieties. Absolutely, 100%. Thanks for letting me mutter along there. Can I ask you <laughs> another kind of question? You have studied neurologically the brains of some very cool people who are really far along in practice. And there's this general principle of modeling people who are far along, whether it's surfing or <laughs> rock climbing or awakening, and then reverse engineering ourselves. Like, okay, how could I start establishing some of the kind of cool factors of the mind that are grounded in factors in the body, notably in the brain? So as someone who has observed people closely, including neurologically, um, who are very far along in practice, and as someone who knows more about his own brain than 99.999% of the population, what have you taken away from that yourself in terms of personal practices uh, or distinctions that you really are aware of and trying to help yourself in regard to that may also be of general value to the rest of us? Well, I think the principle of simplification also applies here because the more I've learned from all these different experiments that we've done, you know, with the neuroimaging and whatnot, the more it's really distilled down to a simple single thing. So I'll, I'll say what that is and then I'll say why that is. And then I'll say it afterwards in case folks missed it, because this is really important. The, it, it really comes down to this felt experience of contraction versus expansion, okay? And so just as a, to give some flavor around that, when we're anxious, we feel contracted. When we're frustrated, we feel contracted. My lab's done studies on this, you know, to, to confirm it, you know, with hundreds of people, but I think we all know this from our own experience. At least that's what our data, our population level data suggests is that most people, when they feel anxious, they feel more closed than they feel open. When they feel frustrated, closed versus, you know, the, as compared to open. When they feel angry, um, sometimes that can be confusing for some people because it anger, anger feels energizing. But it's still, if you just look at your eyes when you're angry, do they tend to be more narrowed or open, you know, wide open? They're narrowed because anger is saying, I know what I'm going to do and I'm going to go do it. <laughs> it's very organizing, right? So as compared to like, oh, let me take in some more information. Let me get your point of view again. You know, no, it's like, I'm going to charge and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to show you that I'm, I'm doing my thing. So in contrast to that, those closed states, uh, curiosity, kindness, connection, all feel open. And from a reward-based learning standpoint, open states feel more rewarding than closed states. And so our, our brains and our bodies are set up in this hierarchy, in this reward hierarchy, to prefer kindness and connection and curiosity over division, over anger, over anxiety. So going linking this to the neurobiology, 
when we first looked at our first study of experienced meditators, <laughs> I'm laughing because we expected some part of the brain to be activated. And I was, you know, we looked at our results and I'm like, where is it? And we looked everywhere and we looked twice and we looked three times. There was nothing statistically significant in terms of increased activity and experience versus novice meditators, which totally you know, through our hypotheses out the window and said, okay, we've got to think about this differently. Well, let's look to see if there's anything that's less active in experience versus novice meditators. And here we saw something really remarkable, which was there are these, there's this default one network of the brain, which is basically named as such because it's what we default to when we're not doing anything else in particular. And it happens to be a network involved in self-reference. Basically, we're thinking about ourselves because when we're not doing anything particular, you can guess who or related to us. You know, so us is something that we're thinking about because we're always thinking about ourselves. That's just kind of how our brains are set up. So we default to this self-referential state, and expert meditators were deactivating this default mode network. At least these two core hubs of the default mode: the prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. So that was really interesting, and it helps us look at this differently, not as a, oh, there's something increased in activity in experienced meditators' brains. Maybe they're just kind of not doing the things that people tend to do. And the maybe an analogy would be if we're driving a car, and we're driving the car, and we're thinking, man, I'm not getting very good gas mileage, and we realize that our we've got one foot on the brake, we take our foot off the brake and suddenly we get better gas mileage and we're driving faster without having done anything to add to the process. We're taking away from the process. So we're taking this self-referencing out of the process. What we did then was we started to bring, so we replicated that to make sure it was true with a larger population, it was true. And then we started bringing this together using a technique called neurophenomenology where we could give people real-time feedback from their own brain. So we could correlate their subjective experience with their brain activity because brain activity really suffers from one big caveat, which is called reverse inference. You see a brain act, a brain region get active and then you, you, know, you say, well, this brain region is associated with this function. And so you just assume because it's active, it must be doing that thing. That's called reverse inference. That's a big problem. We don't know that that's actually true. But what we can do is we can use these real-time neurofeedback experiments to see when a brain region is active and ask somebody, okay, what were you doing that moment that your brain region was active or less active? And then we can line those up and then we, we can get past that reverse inference. What we found was that we could refine these deactivations in experienced meditators down to this felt experience of kind of getting caught up in one's experience versus letting go. So if somebody's caught up in their experience, they activate their default mode network if they let go, they deactivate their default mode network. And is, this isn't just experienced meditators. So this is where this applies to the rest of us, you know, not just these folks that have been meditating their whole lives. It really comes down to it, the, the process as compared to the result. So in any one moment, any of us can be paying attention to our experience and in that moment, we can be paying attention to how caught up we are in our experience versus how much we've let go or how balanced we are, how even we are, how even killed we are, however you want to think of that. Um, and Or you can think of it as contracted versus expanded, right? If we're caught up, we're contracted, that there's that felt sense of contraction. If we're not caught up, we tend to be more expanded. And here, if we really are not caught up, if we're really expanded, that expansion can get so big that we kind of lose a sense of where we end and where the rest of the world begins. And here's where we get into territory like Chicks, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi talked about in terms of flow, where it, you know, it's selfless because we don't know where we end and where the rest of the world begins. So all of this, I think, fits together nicely and it comes back to this simple notion of you know, noticing, am I caught up in something? Am I taking something personally, you know, versus am I not caught up? Am I, am I feeling more open? Am I feeling more expanded? Nobody needs an fMRI machine. Nobody needs a neurofeedback machine to do this. 
it's just about calibrating our experience and noticing what those two extremes feel like and then starting to really refine our awareness to see all the subtle aspects of of contraction versus expansion. Judd, a beautiful, profound, and for me personally valuable, a sweet ending or a sweet closing of this wave we've been riding here together. And I really want to thank you for it. And frankly, alongside obviously your jumbo intellect, your huge heart, heart motivated you, it's carried you, it's so evident, radiates from you. And I want to really thank you for it. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you for this conversation. I really enjoyed it. So today we had the true pleasure of speaking with Dr. Judd Brewer. I'm sure you could tell that we had a wonderful time talking with Judd. He is just such an incredibly um, informed and intelligent and thoughtful person while also being a world-class researcher, while also being a really, really good guy. And it's just a wonderful and rare combination. We began the conversation by talking about Judd's personal journey, how he trained as a psychiatrist and then over time increasingly incorporated meditation and mindfulness practices into his research. And he found, based on that research, that they were really very effective interventions for a wide variety of individual problems. In his first book, The Craving Mind, Judd really focused in on addiction and found that various mindfulness practices could be extremely effective there. One of the things that he really returned to throughout the conversation is the importance of being able to observe and understand the processes of your own mind. If you don't know that something's going on, well, it's really hard to fix it. We talked for a little while about the structure of habits, habit loops and how liking and wanting differ in the brain. A point that both Judd and Rick made several times was that there are fundamentally different structures inside of the brain that govern the feeling of liking something versus the feeling of wanting it, what we also in Buddhism refer to as craving. One of the things that both Judd and Rick emphasized several times throughout the conversation was that there are different structures in the brain itself that govern the experience of liking versus the experience of wanting. And if we're a little practiced about this, we could really actually notice the brain move from a state of liking to a state of wanting. Judd gave a lovely example of eating an ice cream cone and realizing that he was already craving the next bite while the previous one was still in his mouth. He had totally lost touch with enjoyment and was getting sucked along by wanting. From there, we talked about anxiety, and particularly the habit of anxiety. Judd's really connected anxiety to habit loops in his work and explored how we can make anxiety less rewarding. He also talked for a little while about how anxiety gets formed as a habit, and how worry of different kinds can actually be quite soothing for our system. One of the things I really liked about what Judd said was his emphasis of the valuable role of curiosity in this process, being curiosity about our minds, our brains, our nature as people, our behaviors out in the world. And the more curious that we are about it, if we can have that kind of investigatory mindset about the whole thing, the more information, ultimately, of course, we're going to glean from it. And that just steepens our potential growth curve over time. We closed the conversation with Rick asking, I thought, a really lovely question. What is it that distinguishes people who are really far along in their mindfulness practice from people who are just beginning? Is there something fundamentally different about the way that their brain works? And Judd certainly dove into the neuroscience behind this and the parts of the brain that are more active or maybe more importantly, less active, inexperienced meditators. But for me, the real takeaway was how he framed it at the very beginning. The important distinction is between contraction and expansion. And we can feel this in so many places in our lives. It generally feels a lot better to feel a little bit more expanded rather than a little bit more contracted. And you can try it right now if you want to. You can see how your posture changes when you feel like you squeeze your body together versus when you relax and allow your collarbones to kind of open up, the chest expands, the body changes. Huh, what are the sensations of those two different postures? And what does that tell us 
about the best way to be in this world altogether. If you've been enjoying the podcast, we'd really appreciate it if you would take a moment to subscribe to it through the platform of your choice and maybe even leave a rating and a positive review. It really does help us out. Also, if you'd like to support us in other ways, we're on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. I am sure that the expanded notes that I'm going to put together for this episode are going to be a uh, a real a real process for me. They're going to be a lot of work. Generally, when we talk about more kind of academically oriented topics or we reference a lot of research, that means I need to put a little bit more into the notes. And I'm sure that the notes for this episode are going to be a good one. So if you sign up for our Patreon, you'll get those in addition to other benefits from the show, like transcripts of our conversations and ad-free versions of these episodes. As always, thanks so much for supporting the show, and we'll talk with you next week.